thank you all so much for joining us today for the second part of our Intro to Hieroglyphs workshop. My name is Calgary and I'm the Youth and Family Program Manager at the Oriental Institute. And I'm joined again today by Katie Witt, who is a PhD candidate at the Oriental Institute studying Egyptology. Um, so she's going to be doing the bulk of the teaching about hieroglyphs today. I'm really just around to help out. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, glad to see some familiar faces from Tuesday and also welcome to everyone who wasn't able to come on Tuesday but is joining us now. Um, just to get off to the right foot so that everyone knows what we're talking about here, I'll give a little bit of synopsis of what we did on Tuesday, just so we're on the same page. Um, this workshop is for you to learn bits and pieces, learn a little bit more about hieroglyphs in general. Um, unfortunately, we're only going to learn a couple words together. We're going to talk about the alphabet and a couple words. Um, we won't be able to learn everything in our time together, but I hope that you take advantage of future workshops and keep learning about hieroglyphs on your own. Um, it's really fun. I think it's really fun, but I'm biased. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about um, what we did last time. So talk about hieroglyphs in general. You're with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, there's a writing system that uses little pictures instead of our alphabet or another same. Yep, I see somebody's got their alphabet sheet ready. So if you see in the links on the side, you can take a look at the hieroglyphic alphabet sheet. Um, and we were working with that a lot this time. You're going to need it with you today as well. And you can see on that sheet that we have different signs that either can stand for one letter sound, or you can also have certain signs that are stand in as called biliterals or triliterals, which means that you could have one sign that makes two sounds. So you could have a different one. I'll pull it up. So we've got certain signs that kind of stand in and make a kind of a dual sound together. Or I wouldn't necessarily call the, the box here, this rectangle here, a, a biliteral, but it makes in our system of speaking, it make a sh sound, it's an SH sound. So they don't perfectly correspond to our alphabet. There's certain letters you'll notice that are missing. These are only a, like a very small selection of signs. There are, at certain periods of time in Egyptian history, up to a thousand different little hieroglyphs. So you can have a lot of different things, a lot of different signs, especially in later periods where you have, for a long time in Egyptian history, the L, the lion, actually was not a sign. That was something that was invented later when you had Greek speakers that you needed something to represent an L sound. So there's different things that change over time. Somehow I'm having some writing on the side. That's fun. But what we're going to look at today, um, we're going to try and look at some actual pieces and use our alphabet to try and understand some of those words. Looking at, also in the sidebar, you can see there's a sheet from last time. If you have your worksheet packet from last time, um, let's pull that up. It's the one that looks like this. That's your intro to hieroglyphs part one. And we're gonna look at this finding key hieroglyph sheet. So if you remember last time we looked at some of these some of these words that are going to come up today. So you want to have that also next to you or nearby, and I'll pull it up too when we're looking at these deals. So these are just some words that they can stand, you can have a one sign that can stand in for a whole word. So like looking at nefer or wab right here. So nefer or wab, you have one sign that can do Kind of double duty here. You can also have words that are written out with more signs. Sometimes you'll get a single sign that this is can stand by itself. Other times you need them in conjunction with other signs to make sense, like our alphabet. 
Okay, so I will stop the screen share for just a minute. And let's talk a little bit about, I mentioned last time that there are other phases of the Egyptian language too that I'm just gonna mention briefly and show you. So you saw how those signs are really nice, pretty pictures. And they can stand in for a whole word, they can stand in for just a letter sound or a multiple letter sound. But after a while, if you try dry, drying those out, your hand gets really tired and it becomes really complex and you can't write as quickly as you would like if you were trying to actually transcribe what someone was saying. If you were doing an official legal document and you're trying to write down exactly what they're saying, it's gonna go pretty slow. I see a hand from, from Leah. Yeah, I'll, un I'll unmute you here. What's your question? What makes the sound? What makes the sound of the letter E? Letter E. That's a great question. So in English, the letter E is a really complex letter. Sometimes, remember, you can think of like a silent E as well. So you can have different, and if you put some some E's together, they make a longer sound. For a short E sound, just if you're just trying to go E, then it's the reed leaf. It would just be a single reed leaf, um, kind of like the I sound. And that's, yeah, and when you get a longer E sound, you can have the double reed leaf, it makes it a little bit of a longer sound, which also we kind of correspond to our Y as well. But our vowels are something that don't really perfectly match up to the ancient Egyptian system. So sometimes the sounds, we rely on how sounds sound in our mouth instead of a perfect letter-to-letter -letter correspondence. Like Alice brought up a really good point last time about the letter C and how in our alphabet, you can either have a hard C sound, which can sound like a K, or it can be a softer C sound that sounds like an S. So the ancient Egyptians not having a C, they would just use either the K, the basket, for the hard, hard C sound, or the S for a, a softer C sound. Yeah. So let's look at some different examples here and I will pull up here so after a while of writing out these signs a lot it becomes kind of what we have in English which is or in our system of cursive so you start to see that the signs kind of become more simplistic and they run together a little bit more and this is towards um, you have middle, a little bit later in Egyptian history than the original hieroglyphs. So they're used at the same time period for many time periods, but this is much easier to write quickly than drawing out the full sign. And then when you get a little bit later in history, it's still the same Egyptian language, but it gets even more cursive. And let's see if I can share, screen share about this example. It does not want to let me. Here, let's do this. There we go. So now we have, this is called demotic script. Um, and this becomes even more cursive and stylized. So it becomes, you can write this even quicker than you could write even heretic before. So these are the different phases that I said that we'd mentioned a little bit. And they, both of these objects, this one in the demotic script is on display um, in the Egyptian gallery as part of a marriage contract from the late period. And the jar stand here is a little bit earlier. And that is also on display. Oh, I see another hand. You have a question? Yes. Uh, when did they stop um, using hieroglyphs? That is a great question. So they stopped using hieroglyphs. The last hieroglyphic inscription we have is from the Roman period. 
So you're talking about like the fourth century AD. So let's say, yeah, let's say like 1600 years ago, they stopped using it. Yeah. And it was last used in a temple setting. And by that point, what's interesting is that even though they were writing down the glyphs, they actually couldn't read them. So they're kind of like us. They're just like, we really appreciate the hieroglyphs, but sometimes it's harder to read them. <laughs> I saw a hand with Leah. <laughs> Leah, did you have a question? No? Okay. Do we have another question? I heard another voice. No? Okay. Okay. Then let's go ahead and let's practice our, for using the worksheets for today. So if you could look into the links on the side, we want to open the one that says to, um, today's activity packet. And you're going to want to have your, your alphabet sheet handy. And I'll open this too. Let's, let's go to the beginning of, of the first thing we're going to do today. Go back and screen share here so that we're all on the same page. First thing we're going to do is look at some of these examples that we have actually in our galleries. And when you do this as a workshop where we're actually getting to go see the objects, it's a lot of fun, but we're going to try <laughs> and use the worksheet here. Um, and then you can come back later once the museum's open again and come see them in person because they're really pretty. But let's use our alphabet sheet and try and read some of these names. So we'll start from this corner here, um, upper the upper left-hand corner. So... We see this little box here, this box here that has a cartouche in, inside of it. And we talked very briefly about what a cartouche is um, last time, and I'll just talk about it again. So when you see a cartouche, which is this oval shape that kind of has like a, a bottom to it, a foot to it, this is something that means that you're, you're looking at a king's name. So if you see a cartouche on any piece of Egyptian art, it means that that's the name of a king. And so even though this stila is for somebody else, this is for actually an official, we know that they're mentioning the name of the king in this inscription. So let's read, let's figure out which king this is. So everybody look at your alphabet sheets and which one, where's, what's this little square, what's this little box? We've got two of them in a row. We've got two of those little boxes and then a double reed leaf. And Katie, can you give us a refresher on how we know which direction to read these hieroglyphs? Thank you. That was a big part of yesterday, too, that I didn't, I didn't mention today. So you're going to look at one, what the activities we did last time. We did one that was called Name in All Directions from, the last, from yesterday's or Tuesday's packet. Um, and you can look at just from this example, just from this sheet, you see that there's four different examples here. And the hieroglyphs are going all different directions. The way, the trick to read hieroglyphs is you always read, you find a bird or some sort of person or animal. So you can see there's tons of birds. So there's a bird, there's a snake, you see the bee here, you got a seated person here. You look for something that has a head and you always read into the face of that animal or person. And so from this inscription, one thing, the one direction that you don't read is you don't read from bottom up. So you can read left to right, you can read right to left, you can kind of go around in different, different formula, different directions, but you always start at the top and work your way down. And then depending on which direction things are facing, that's the way you move into them. So this inscription actually starts at the top right here if everyone can see where my cursor is. It starts right by this little, little papyrus. And you read from right to left, and then you go down to the next line, 
and read that direction and read that direction. And when you have multiple signs that are stacked like this, you actually you read from top down as well. And then you move on to the next column. So, oh, I have all these arrows everywhere. I don't know what that's doing. <laughs> we'll ignore those. Hopefully they go away. Um, I think we had a question. I see screen lane, uh, love Greek myth. Did you have a question you wanted to ask Katie? I saw your hand up in the video. Yep, your hands up. We have a lot of Greek myth fans here. Yeah. yeah. And I see other Greek. Okay, well, Greek myth said never mind. But Greek myth fan, do you have a question? I see your hand up. We'll unmute you here. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Um. If you if you if you don't know if if you're an archaeologist and you don't know how to um read which way the um and you don't know how to read which way the animal is going how do you know what it says oh if you don't have an animal yeah that's a great question um so you it's very very rare that an inscription would have no animals it, it'd be very hard to find an inscription with no animals because a lot of the the most common words that you find will always have an animal in them. So I think it'd be it kind of if you found in if you were an archaeologist and you found an inscription that had no animals in it, my mind would be like, I think that's fake. I don't think that that's a real artifact <laughs> if there's no animals in the inscription. So we also we know from just practicing after a lot of times of reading different texts you kind of get used to the way that things are grouped and the way that you would read a text and you can try and look for specific words and you pick out the words that you know first just like in english if you were reading a sentence and you didn't you couldn't understand all the different words but you were able to just get bits and pieces that's at least a starting point and then we can work backwards from that. I'm still getting lots of different arrows that I have no idea why. But <laughs> so let's That's go right. back to this cartouche here. Um, and so we have two P's in a row. So if we're trying using our dashes at the bottom, we're going to write P, E, P, and then Y. Who had Peppy? Yeah? Hopefully everybody had Peppy. And so that's a trick that now we have something, we're going to see that in a couple of these names, where you have two of the same consonants, so that means a, a letter that's not a vowel, in a row. And we, because the ancient Egyptians did not write vowels the same way that we do, in order for us to vocalize and in order us to say these words out loud, what we do is we add, we kind of insert these vowels. And a lot of times, um, Egyptologists in the past have used E as the generic kind of vowel in between these letters. So when we read this one, it ends up being Peppy. Isn't that a fun king's name? Peppy. <laughs> so let's go on to the next one then. Almost like and Poppy? Kind of like Poppy, yeah. Like Pepsi. Yeah. Kind of Where you, have, Pepsi. you have to have a vowel in between those. So the next one here. Kind of sounds like Pepsi. Pepsi. That's what I meant to say. Pepsi. Kind of sounds like the word Pepsi. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. So it's like they had a king named after a drink. King Pepsi. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at the next one then. Let's look at this one at the top here. So this one has a box that we've driven. Drove, driven? that we've drawn around <laughs> the name of this woman. So we know it's her name because it's right next to her, it's seated right next to her. And so what's, we're gonna read this the same direction. So we know that from this bird here and from the way that she's sitting, that we're going to read from this corner now. We're gonna read left to right. So we're gonna start at the top here of this name and we're gonna read left to right. So we're gonna go, the first letter of this name is the I, and then we have two little bread loaves. Those are T's. 
So you're going to have I, T, E, T. Etet is her name. And again, we have two consonants in a row, so we're going to put our E in between it so it makes it easier than going it just, it'd be harder without a, an E sound. Perfect. Okay, and now we're going to scroll down a little bit. We're going to go to this one now on the left-hand side. So this is a different direction from the last one, but it's the same direction as the one above it. Because see, we've looked, we've located our bird and our snake. They're both looking this way. So we'll go to our box then. What is this letter? It's a, the letter of a foot with like the little part of a leg. That's the B, right? It's the B sound. So we've got a B. We've got another reed leaf. We learned that from the last one, the last word. So we've got an I sound. So B. And then this one, there are a lot of birds in ancient Egyptian. You'll find when you're looking at hieroglyphs, there are tons of different birds and they all mean different things. You can see in, at least in this piece alone, you got two different birds. This one is the quail chick. And so this makes the ooh sound, the W sound. So it's bew. And then this one, we're gonna go to this stila and when I'm going to put a plug in for when we do this full work uh, workshop. We read this whole stila together. So come back again when we're back in the galleries and we read this whole stila together. But if you look at your sheet from last week or from Tuesday, so we'll go back to this one. You can see we've put this as a finding aid. So I'm going to challenge you after we're done here to use both your worksheets and see what other, how many other times you can see all these hieroglyphs in these stela that we're working on today. We, we won't have time to look at them today together, but see how many times you can read these signs in the different, in the different stela. Um, I see Savannah has a raised hand. Let's see, Savannah, do you wanna unmute yourself? When writing hieroglyphs, if you, if, how do we know which bird to use? That's a great question. So just like we memorize our own alphabet, the scribes that were writing these, that were carving all of these monuments, they had it memorized. So they knew exactly which words were spelled with which bird. And so just like on the alphabet sheet, when you have a difference between an A sound and an ooh sound, they would know the same thing for their most common words. And this goes along with spoken language too. So this is something that they were speaking. So Egyptian is not, it's something that we have the hieroglyphs to kind of help us. We actually don't know how the Egyptian language was vocalized, how they said it out loud. So we are making our, we're using our best guess. We're trying to understand how they spoke. Um, but these words would have been as regular to them as they are as English words are to us. Yeah. So let's go down one more to the next sheet here. And we got the element names. And so we've got three examples of different cartouches here that you can find in the galleries. And remember what we said about cartouches. That means that we're automatically, when you see a cartouche, we're looking at the name of the king. So sometimes it's a little bit more complex, the order of reading signs, than just starting from top to bottom. Sometimes, after a while, they start moving things around because of something, especially when you're looking at cartouches and you have different images of God in those cartouches. Oh, I see Leah. Yep. Leah, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do we know what everything means? We know because a lot of people have studied this for a very long time. So they've made a lot of different comparisons. 
they've looked at it for a very long time and then they wrote those ideas down and we can kind of translate off of those ideas and we're always learning new words there's always some words that we don't know what they mean and we as as specialists are constantly trying to understand that greek myth fan i see your hand up all right there you go Low battery and charging it why did, why did it take so long to discover king tutankhamun's tomb why did it take so long? That's a separate. That's a separate question. But I think that I think the easy answer is it was really well hidden. It was really well hidden. And this is something actually. This middle cartouche here on this sheet comes from the back of, believe it or not, a statue of of King Tut that we know now is of King Tut from his temp from his mortuary temple. But let's read this real quick together. I see so looking what I using this key at the top of the sheet here. Look at this numbers then, and let's see if we read this name. So the first one, the number one is the bird that's for a, the falcon, and that stands for Horus or Hor for short. So we know that this is Hor, and then two is M or M. And then this last sign here is also, it looks very similar to one that you might have had on your other sheet, but this is a little bit different. It's hard to see here. There's a little diamond written in the middle of that, and that's Heb. So for this cartouche, we have Hor M Heb. So that's interesting, right? We have a cartouche on the back of Tut, but what's the name? We just read it, it's Horemheb. So now you can want, go back and when you see this in the galleries, you can see that cartouche and try and understand why do you think someone else's name is on the back of Tut's statue? That's not his name. So that's a puzzle that you can see when you're in the galleries next. One thing to th keep in mind that I didn't really explain with these, so when you're looking at this on your own later, if you want to go back and, and work through these more, is that sometimes with specific gods, you get a lot of, <laughs> oh, I see. They're somehow able to write. <laughs> I think you can erase it. I don't know how to, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think you can erase it as you're the sharing person. Um, oh, I see. I don't know how to do that. Well, thank you for all the heart, but we'll just, we'll talk about <laughs> this first. Um, so just real quick, and then I'll get to Jamie's question. So sometimes you get different God's names that are come before, because they get something that's called honorific transposition, which is a really big word for just basically saying that because the gods were so important to the ancient Egyptians, when they used their name, when they used the name of a god in their own names, they put the name of the god first. And so that's a way of honoring the gods by putting their name first. So that's something to keep in mind. And then this next activity at the end, this is something you can do at home. But I saw Jamie had a raised hand. Let's go to Jamie. Um, so, uh, I don't think you can disable the drawing, but I know for a fact, this is just on the annotation thing, I know for a fact that if you go, uh, that anybody who is not the screen presenter, um, if you go up to view options, um, you can essentially click, uh, annotate, and then there's an eraser tool. Oh, okay. This is also how everything else is happening. Thank you. So, thought I'd Thank let you know. I, yeah, this is new to me. I am I am impressed. But what I'll do is I'll stop sharing right now because we'll done we're done with those documents, and I'll just go back to see how many questions. Oh, I see a lot of hands. I see. Let's see. I see Roman here. Well, I don't know if this. Is, I think it's probably a parent's name. I don't think. But look, let's see. What question do you have, guys? Here, I'll unmute you. Unmute. There we go. Go ahead, Ian. Um, 
Um, so the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptians didn't like connect the feet or the heads to the picture because the the hieroglyphs were so powerful. They didn't want them to just jump off the wall and go away. Yeah, sometimes that is something about hieroglyphs that's really interesting, that the ancient Egyptians thought that they had power, just like all images, that they were powerful. And that's why sometimes you mm -hmm. see in certain tombs, you actually see particular hieroglyphs, a lot of times snakes in particular, um, where they're kind of chopped in half, or you'll only see a part of the hieroglyph. And that's so that they wouldn't jump off the wall and hurt the person that was in the tomb, because they believed that that could happen. So the way they would stop that from happening is by kind of making, taking away the power of the hieroglyph by chopping it in half. Very good. What's another question? I saw a different hand here. What about K8 Doza? I'll unmute you here. Right there, yeah, you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. I want to know why they built the pyramids. Oh, the Israelites were first to walk, but why did they? Why did Pharaoh make the Israelites build the pyramids? That is a really tough question, but we know actually now from a lot of scientific study that the Israelites didn't actually build the pyramids. And that's something that the, Pharaoh, the Egyptian people, they were Egyptians. We know that we have those bodies from the people who worked on the pyramids, and we know that they're Egyptians, and we know that they did this in service to their king as kind of part of, part of, kind of paying their taxes a little bit, that they, they helped build the pyramids so that their king could live forever. Okay, great. I Fan, I think I've got your hand. And then I see Jamie is raising their hand too. Oh, so I'm sorry, Jamie. We'll get back to you too. Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, Islam took over Egypt, but then they let them be their own country. But they still do Islamic stuff in Egypt. Oh, I did. I didn't hear that question all the way. I don't think. What was your question? I said. Islam took over Egypt, but they let Egypt be their own country, and but they still do Islamic stuff in Egypt. So after the Islamic conquest of Egypt, yeah, they yeah. So religion changed and language changed over time. Yeah, they speak um, Arabic now. I'm sorry. They speak Arabic now. You're right. They speak Arabic now in Egypt. Yes. So ancient Egyptian language that we know today is actually not spoken anymore. There's something kind of similar that there is called Coptic. And that's what cer a certain religious community in Egypt, the Coptic Christians um, in Egypt, still have some remnants of Egyptian language in their language that's used in church. But yeah, today nobody speaks ancient Egyptian anymore. Now they speak modern Arabic in Egypt or Egyptian Arabic in Egypt. Very good. Jamie, what was your question? Sorry, that was um, me. I forgot to put my hand down from before. Oh, okay, no problem, no problem. Let's see, is there anything else? Well, I think, yeah, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to ask them. I know we've gone a little uh, over time because there's been so much enthusiasm, so that's great. Um, I guess one word uh, on the packet, there's an extra activity that you're welcome to try out on your own. There's also an answer key. So um, if you can't, if you get stuck, there's solutions for that. And then if you have any questions that come up later um, and you want to reach out to us, I'm going to put our email address uh, down below in the chat so you can send us an email and we'll get back to you. And then as a last note, I'll also be sending out a survey after this. So if you were one of your parents or guardians can fill that out. We'd love to hear what you think. All right. Anything you else, all Katie? Coming. I 
I don't think so. unless there's any last questions, we'll hang around for just a couple more minutes. But thank you all for coming and hopefully we'll see you again soon at the OI. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I see a question. I think Roman, do you have a question? Okay. Well, I'll meet you here. Actually, can you unmute yourself, Roman? I, I can't seem to unmute you. Or you can type your question in the chat if you can't unmute. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead, do it. Just say the question. Yeah. Uh, that they build the pyramids to put the tombs in. So the tomb robbers, like today, they didn't get all the gold and stuff that the um, pharaohs had. Yeah, that's the, that's the idea of making tombs hidden. Because after a while, they realized that the pyramids really made the tombs pretty visible, right? If you yeah. make a giant pyramid and you, everyone knows that, that, that there's treasure inside. Everyone knows that that's where the king's buried. So it becomes a little bit of a target for robbers. And so what they did is then in later periods, they started hiding their tombs. And that's where you get the Valley of the Kings, where you have all these hidden tombs, where King Tut is one of the kings that was hidden. Yeah, and... Um they made um, one, only one ending lead to the tomb, and all the other endings go tracks, for, tracks. for a long time, and then there was a dead end. Then you have to walk all the way back, then finally you get to the tomb. Yeah, they were very clever. They really tried hard to make sure that the king had everything he needed for the afterlife. Very good. Um, I, um, I, I have a question. Yeah. Who discovered like hieroglyphics? Like after the ancient Egyptian time when people stopped using hieroglyphics, who found out about them after that? That's a great question. So I think people in Egypt always knew that they were there. They, know, they knew they couldn't read them after a while. So they knew that they were there. Um, and even after they couldn't understand them anymore, they were still using them because they thought they were magical. Uh, they thought they were magic. And so they would, people knew about them, but it wasn't until they weren't deciphered uh, until Champollion, who was able to use the Rosetta Stone to actually look at Greek and Demotic and Egyptian and work back to try and understand what's going on with the hieroglyphs. And so that's when, after he deciphered that using the Rosetta Stone, now everyone else could come in and try and understand using the alphabet as the basic, the basic level, could try and piece all these words back together. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Or we can do two. I see uh, two hands up. So is it Leah? Do you want to go? No. Okay. No. Okay. Roman. Not... So, um, who who figured out how to do hieroglyph? What hieroglyphs was one of the guys? His name is Tote. Tote? I don't think he figured it out. I think he's just one of the gods, right? Yeah, but he's um the the one the, the Egyptian person who's the one who figures out the writing stuff. He's the god of writing. Yeah, so we have Toth. Thoth is what you're, is the guy you're talking about. And he, yeah, he was the ancient Egyptian god of writing and knowledge. So, and there's also a female counterpart too to him, believe it or not. Her name is Sasha. And so she, she might have even been earlier, believe it or not, than Toth. So that's interesting. Now I know um, what you just said. Now, um, how they, so she did, um, taught how to do the earlier Egyptian writing, and then so Toth um, did the, a little bit later, right? Maybe, yeah, that's something people are still studying to see when 
if this if the goddess was before Toth, but we know that yep, people thought that Toth invented hieroglyphs. How do you become an Egyptologist? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I'm still working on it, and it's basically you do a lot of school, so you follow. I started off. I'm an archaeologist, and then I started studying more language. And I now I study Egyptology. Have you ever gone to the field to dig stuff up? I did. I did. Unfortunately, I didn't get to dig the year that I was in Egypt because of some political stuff that was going on. But a lot of people, especially at the with the Oriental Institute, go to Egypt pretty regularly. And we, we do have digs. All right, that is all the time we have today. Um, but I see that there's so many questions. So maybe we'll just have to do a Q&A with Katie someday all about Egypt. Um, yeah. But for now, thank you all so much for joining us. And we will see you next time we're going to be doing programs over the summer. So be on the lookout for emails about those and check our website. And we hope to see lots of you over the summer too. So with that, yeah, we'll say good, or good afternoon and see you later. Thank you. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu member.